This is a short video that aims to show that continuous functions over a closed bounded interval are Riemann integrable. Uh, now the first thing before we get into that is we're going to talk about a step function really quick. So just to remind you what a step function is, uh, we're denoted by phi here. And so it's a function that only just has a finite number of distinct values uh, as its outputs. And so what the first thing I want to talk about or I'm just going to state it rather. This, I'm not going to prove this. I'll draw you a picture about why you should believe it, but you can think about what the proof would look like. Um, if you've got a function that's a step function, then it's got to be Riemann integrable on its domain. And so to give you a picture of that, typically here's what a step function looks like, right? It's, it's going to be a bunch of horizontal lines as its graph, and I'm saying there's only a finite number of values this function can assume. Therefore, there's only finite many choices for where these vertical lines are. And so what would the value of the integral of this function phi be? It would just be us taking the height, whether it's you know above the x-axis or below the x-axis. So ki could be a negative number uh, times the length of the subinterval that I'm on, or, or in this case, you know the length of where, where is the value of the function k1. Well, in my picture, the value of the function is k1 between x0 and x1. So if I just add up those areas, that should be the value of the integral. So again, that's not a formal proof by any means, but that just gives you some intuition that, yeah, I bet step functions are Riemann integrable. Now, in my opinion, the more interesting thing is if you've got a continuous function on a closed bounded interval, then that's Riemann integrable. So let's talk about using that. By the way, to do this proof, you can bet we're going to talk about that step functions are Riemann integrable. But the other thing that we're going to use is the squeeze theorem for Riemann integrable functions. So if you didn't watch that video, you should go check it out so you're familiar with it. So we get to assume that f is continuous on this closed bounded interval from a to b. But if you remember in the videos about continuity, we showed that well, a continuous function on a closed bounded interval is in fact uniformly continuous. That's a little bit more of a stronger definition where remember the definition of continuity, there's an epsilon and for each epsilon, there is a delta. Delta depends on x and epsilon for continuous. It's okay if it depends on x, the point that you're trying to show you're continuous at. However, uniform continuity, that should work no matter what x's you're considering. So it should only depend on epsilon. Delta should only depend on epsilon, not on where you're trying to show a function's continuity. Difference between continuity and uniform continuity. So what am I saying to you though? I'm saying to you that those concepts are in fact the same thing if you're on a closed bounded interval like AB. So let's write this down. So what does it mean that F's uniformly continuous from A to B? That means given epsilon, there exists a delta that only depends on epsilon such that anytime you have two numbers U and V that are within delta of each other, then the outputs are within, in my case, I'm gonna choose epsilon over B minus A. So in this case, um, I kinda of wanna go back for a second. There, I'm back. All right, cool, so remember, given any any number here, if I want my outputs to be with that close to each other, right? What we're saying is if it's uniformly continuous, I know that I could find a delta so that uh, I could eventually find some window around the inputs so that the outputs are this close to each other. I hope that that makes sense how I've said that. And you'll see why epsilon over B minus A is special a little bit later on in the proof. Now back to this. So I've got this interval from A to B, and you know we're talking about integrals, so it makes sense. We're probably gonna chop it into pieces. We're gonna partition it. So let's say I've got a partition P, and so I'm denoting by II here, it's subintervals. So these are the subintervals in the partition, and let's assume that the norm of that partition is less than this delta here. You'll see why that's important in a little bit too. Oh, what else do we know about continuous functions on closed bounded intervals? So by the way, each one of these IIs is subintervals here, each of those are closed bounded intervals as well. Well, remember that continuous functions, they always achieve their maximum and minimum values on a closed bounded interval. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply that to each one of these subintervals. Sure, you could apply it to the whole interval AB, but what I really care about is looking at uh, each of these subintervals, looking at the function's behavior on each subinterval. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna let UI be the point that's in the subinterval II, where F achieves its minimum value, and we're going to let vi be the point in the subinterval ii. So vi is where f achieves its maximum value in the subinterval ii. 
So I'm looking in each subinterval, I'm looking at what is the smallest value of f in that subinterval, and then I'm looking at what is the largest value of f in that subinterval. Smallest one's denoted by ui, and, uh, or where it happens rather, and the input for which the function achieves its maximum value is vi. And I've tried to draw you a picture here just to try to show what I'm saying here. And so at u1, I see that's where my function's lowest on this first subinterval i1 here. And I see at v1 is where my function is tallest. And so uh, on this first subinterval here. Then I moved, say, to the second subinterval in my partition, which I've you know, just drawn you a picture, labeled in orange here. So u1 is the next lowest, and v1 is the next highest, and carry on that way. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a couple of functions. We're going to let alpha epsilon here be the function defined by alpha epsilon of x is going to be f of ui if x is in the subinterval xi minus 1 to xi. And we're going to let that happen for each of my first n minus 1 subintervals. So that's going to be true for, say, i1, i2, all the way up to i n minus 1, so which means that I just need to define what does alpha do on the last subinterval, i n, and we're just going to let alpha of epsilon of x be, uh, it should just be, I think it should be f of u n, sorry about that, that's definitely a typo, f of u n if x is in there in that last one. All right, and then what we're also going to do so maybe notice, what is alpha effectively doing? I'm saying I'm going to let alpha x just be whatever that smallest value is over that whole subinterval. So if you think about it, alpha is a step function. And I'm going to define uh, another step function called omega epsilon, kind of the same way, but using f of vi instead. So omega uh, sub epsilon of x is going to be f of vi, that constant, over this subinterval, xi minus 1 to xi. And again, that's going to be the story for my first all the subintervals except for maybe the last one, and I'll just let it be f of vn if it's uh, any point inside of here, and including the endpoint. I think if you're wondering, like, why is he making a big deal about this last one here, it's just because I'm saying uh, it's possible that it is the last endpoint as well. That's all. So maybe the minimum or the maximum happens at b, if you want to call it that. Hope that makes sense. Now I've drawn you a picture here, too, to try to show you what just happened. I defined alpha and so also too, I tried to just copy paste my picture above and just add in, you know, what if I was to make a dot where above where u1 is and make a dot above where v1 is, then I'm saying to define those step functions. So again, alpha epsilon is the blue step function. I don't remember why I made it dotted. You could have made them solid lines. So I hope that's not confusing either. And uh, omega epsilon is the purple one. And what I want you to notice from my picture, it sure looks like omega epsilon is always above f. And it sure looks like alpha epsilon is always below f, which maybe makes sense since like those are defined to be the maximum and the minimum values of f over each of my subintervals. And so what we could say then is f of x is always between those two functions. So I've got these two functions that always bound f for every x in the domain of f is what this is trying to say here. Well, I guess really all of it, right? And the next thing I want to look at, and if you're thinking, oh, he's doing some stuff with the squeeze theorem, that's probably why he used alpha and omega as his functions. Yeah, you're right. So what else can we say? Well, from the squeeze theorem, if you remember that video, we need to show that the integral of the difference between my two step functions, so the integral of the difference of, again, in my picture, the purple minus the blue, uh, I need to show that that's less than epsilon. So let's see where we're at. Well, what is the difference? Well, the actual difference here, if I think about how are these step functions defined, this would be well, omega epsilon is f of vi, and alpha epsilon is f of ui uh, for each point in my interval. And then if I'm doing the integral, remember I just need to take, those are what like the function values are, times, in this case, xi minus xi minus 1. So again, the integral is actually equal to that Riemann sum since these two things are nice step functions. Now what we want to do is think about, hmm, what do I know about this difference between f of vi minus f of ui? Well, I made sure that the norm of my partition was less than this delta here, right? And so what that means is that um, in this case, ui and vi they both live in the subinterval ii. So maybe that's, that's kind of confusing to say. Let's take a look here at i1. u1 and v1 both live in the subinterval i1. Now I've chosen the partition so that how long i1 is is less than delta. Therefore, the distance from u1 to v1 has to be less than delta. Well, wait a minute. What I've got then, if you bear with me while I scroll around here, what I've got then is I've got two inputs that are within delta of each other 
by the uniform continuity hypothesis, their outputs have to be within epsilon over b minus a of each other. And so this is where this uniform continuity assumption and kind of this goofy epsilon over b minus a are gonna come in handy. I'm gonna replace this now. I can say that that's less than, this is just less than epsilon over b minus a times this good stuff. And I just wanted to go through the algebra here just to see how do we get down to epsilon. Remember, this sum is changing with respect to i, so this good stuff here is constant, so it can just come out front, so that's where I'll put it. And then now, what happens when you add up each of these? Remember that this is just the length of the subinterval i, i, and so this says to add up all the lengths of your subintervals. But wait a minute, your subintervals just chopped up the whole interval from a to b, so what should the lengths be? When you add up all the lengths, you ought to just get the length of the whole interval back. In other words, this sum should just be equal to b minus a, and voila, now you see that b minus a cancels out. So I just have epsilon. Now to recap, what have I got? Oh, by the way, too, maybe I skipped over this in the beginning. Omega i is always bigger than alpha i, or sorry, omega epsilon is always bigger than alpha epsilon. So I know that this integral has to be non-negative. I hope that makes sense. Probably just glossed right over that with me, though. What have we got, though? We've got that the integral of the difference between these two functions, the bound f, is less than epsilon. So to recap, for an arbitrary epsilon that's positive, we found two functions, alpha and omega, such that, again, they bound f for every x in the, in the domain of f, but then also the integral of their difference is less than epsilon. Those are the exact conditions of the squeeze theorem, which allows to conclude that f must be a Riemann integrable function on this interval from a to b.